العاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. I want to welcome you all back to the firsts. And inshallah ta'ala, what we're going to be doing over the next uh, few weeks is really getting into the details of what I think is one of the most underestimated periods of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of the most difficult episodes in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Muslims really don't know much about, they don't connect much with. But we're going to do so through the eyes of the major figures, through the eyes of the major companions that were involved. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the most important martyrs of that incident. And then I guarantee you a significant plot twist in two weeks. So the next two weeks, we're going to talk about some of the famous martyrs of two incidents within the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ that happened at the same time and that resulted in Probably, again, one of the least studied tragedies in the life of the Messenger وسلم, known as Bi'r Ma'una and al rajir Bi'r Ma'una and al rajir So I want you to think about Uhud. Uhud lives in the memory of all of the Muslims because you go to Medina, you visit the Shuhada of Uhud as is the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, And how many people were martyred in the Battle of Uhud? This great tragedy of Islam. How many people were martyred? A little over 70, 72 or 73 companions of the Prophet And it shook the entire Muslim community. Now, what if I told you that in these incidents that happened right after Uhud, more people were martyred than Uhud itself? So the Prophet would lose more companions in these two tragedies that followed Uhud, Bi'r Ma'una and al rajir than Uhud itself, which really speaks to the complexities of the situation and how these tragedies are being compounded and the Muslims are being tested. Now when you read about these two tragedies in particular, you're going to have the stories of these companions and they're usually grouped together and you just kind of read their names and you don't actually get into their lives. So I wanted us inshallah ta'ala for the next few weeks to focus on some of those companions and identify two of the most important ones, especially in al rajir the incident of al rajir and then speak about them in great detail. So inshallah ta'ala, tonight we're going to speak about Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu. How many Asims do we have in here? Anyone named Asim? I know I do this all the time. No Asims in here? I don't know what's wrong with Valley Ranch. Every time I'm covering a companion and I ask for the name, no one's here. But you all know Asim, right? Everyone knows Asim? Yeah? Okay, good. Any parents of any Asims here? No? Siblings? Oh, mashallah. Okay, we have, we have one Umm Asim, alhamdulillah. So the name Asim is very common uh, in our cultures. You hear it all the time. And usually people will connect the name Asim to Asim ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Asim, the son of Umar bin Khattab. But this Asim is the one that that Asim was named after, that we're going to be talking about tonight. And he has a profound story with the Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the man that we're going to be talking about tonight is Asim ibn Thabit al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Asim ibn Thabit, the original Asim. His nickname, and you'll understand why at the end of this inshaAllah ta'ala, is Dafinullah or Dafinul Malaika. The one who was buried by Allah or the one who was buried by the angels. That is his nickname. So you can anticipate that the ending of this man's story is a deeply profound ending, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So I wanted to speak about him, inshaAllah ta'ala. He was a young man when the Prophet came to Medina. He's from Banu Auf. He embraces Islam as a teenager or just into his 20s, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And his father is a man by the name of Thabit ibn Abi Aqlah or ibn Abi Aflah. Ibn Abi Aqlah or ibn Abi Aflah. Both of them are narrated in the books of Sira. Now I actually made a chart that I'm going to show you all, those of you that want a screenshot or those of you that want to take a picture, if we can put up the chart insha'Allah ta'ala of his family lineage so that you can understand the significance a bit insha'Allah ta'ala of who this man is and where he comes from because often you lose people in the process. So Asim ibn Thabit, his father is Thabit ibn Abi Aflah 
or Thabit ibn Abi Aqlah. His mother, radiallahu ta'ala anha, profound woman, is a woman by the name of Ashamus bint Abi Amir al Rahib. Ashamus bint Abi Amir al Rahib. So his mother embraced Islam, his father passed away before Islam apparently. So it's him and his mother that went to the Prophet وسلم, and they took their bay'ah together. His mother, Ashamus uh, bint Abi Amir, is the sister of one of the most famous companions of the Prophet وسلم, Hanzala ibn Abi Amir عنه, who's known as Ghasir al-Malaika, the one whose body was washed by the angels. So that's his uncle, his maternal uncle. You'll understand why that's so significant once we get to the battle inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, we talked about Hanzala, not in the first, but in Angels 2, the second season of the Angels series. We talked about Hanzala radiallahu anhu. He's the man who literally was taken to the heavens and washed by the Mala'ika. This is his uncle radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he's the son of Thabit bin Abi Aflah, Ash-Shamus, the sister of Hanzala, and his sister is Jamila bin Thabit, the wife of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he's the brother-in-law of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And that's why you're going to see why the famous Asim takes his name. Umar named his son Asim after this Asim. Umar radiallahu anhu named his son Asim after this Asim. And it kind of gives you an idea of the way that the legacies are being passed down, the names and the histories are being passed down. Because Asim ibn Umar never met his uncle Asim ibn Thabit, but it's a great name to be given, right, after his uncle. Now, if any of you have read the story of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, and one day we will spend hours with it, inshaAllah ta'ala, that Asim ibn Umar is the one who ends up marrying a special woman and having a daughter by the name of Layla, who ends up being the mother of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. So one day, this chart will make a lot of sense to you, inshaAllah ta'ala, but I decided to put it together anyway for historical reference, inshaAllah ta'ala, so you can see the transition of names and you can see the transition of legacies. And obviously, you have to be a special person for Umar to name his son after you. Umar radiallahu anhu was very intentional about his children's names. And Umar loves his brother-in-law, Asim ibn Thabit, and names his son Asim Ibn Umar, who becomes a very special companion and a very special uh, figure in Islamic history. Again, the one that most Asims in our Ummah, unless their parents just Googled it uh, or were copying someone else. But if you're named after Asim, you probably found Asim Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. So, Ash-Shamus is the lucky mother of these two special people. She's the mother-in-law of Umar ibn Khattab and she's the mother uh, of Asim ibn Thabit and of course Jamila bin Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Now sometimes, subhanAllah, the name of a person fits the description. The word Asim is a protector, it's a guardian, right? And so when Allah Azza says, لا عاصم لك اليوم, that there is no protection for you in Amrullah from the command of Allah, Asim is a guardian, Asim is a protector. And this Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu is going to be known as one of the guardians of Islam, one of the guardians of the faith. So let's talk about him, inshaAllah ta'ala, a little bit and how he comes into the history of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to Medina, we spoke about this last week, he pairs off brothers and he does mu'akha between the muhajirin and the ansar, the migrants from Mecca and the hosts from Medina in accordance with their personalities and their strengths. So we talked about Abu Dujana and Abu Dujana's brother from the Muhajirin. Uh, this man, Asim, his brother from the Muhajirin is Abdullah ibn Jahsh radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who's known as the first Amir of Islam, the first commander of Al-Islam, one of the earliest Muslims, uh, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the first person who was ever known as an Amir in Islam, the first person the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ever sent as a commander of an army. And so this is his brother. And in this household, you had these two young men who basically would dedicate themselves to long hours in prayer, long hours of qiyam, and dedicate themselves to the defense of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So where do we first actually see him? We see him in the Battle of Badr. He's a strategist. 
And he's someone who automatically brings this element of the tactics of battle, similar to Abu Dujana, to the life of the Prophet And there's an authentic narration from Hussein ibn Sa'ib al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He says, لَمَّا كَانَ لَيْلَةُ بَدْرِ That on the night of Badr, the Prophet said to those that were with him, كَيْفَ تُقَاتِلُونَ What's your strategy? Obviously, on the day of Badr, they are surrounded from all different directions and they have an army that is much larger than theirs. And it's the first time that they're going to encounter a situation like this. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, is going to spend the entire night praying, but he says, what is your strategy? فَقَامَ عَاصِمُ بْنُ ثَابِتْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ فَأَخَذَ الْقَوْسِ so Asim ibn Thabit, he stood up and he was an archer. He had his bow and arrow. And he said to the Prophet وسلم, أَيْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِذَا كَانَ الْقَوْمُ قَرِيبًا مِنْ مِئَتَيْ ذِرَاعٍ أَوْ نَحْوِ ذَلِكْ كَانَ رَمْيٌ بِالْقِصِي He said that, O oh Messenger of Allah, if they are about 200 yards away from us, then we start with the arrows. Then he said to the Prophet ﷺ, then once they get within 200 yards of us, or something close to that, then we start to uh, throw, upon, we start to use a catapult system. So basically we start to throw these large stones on them, right? Then he goes and he marks on the battlefield for the Prophet ﷺ. He says, Ya Rasulullah, when they get to about right here, then we start with the spears and we slow them down again. So he's basically plotting out the whole strategy. Then he says to the Messenger وسلم, once they get to this point, then we pull out our swords and we fight them with our swords. So he maps out for the Prophet وسلم, the entire strategy of the Battle of Badr, starting off with arrows and then the catapults and then the spears, and then at what point we actually start to fight with our swords, the opposing army. The Prophet وسلم, when he saw him, he said something that became very beloved to uh, Asim, and it basically became a badge of honor. The Prophet وسلم, said, بِهَذَا أُنزِرَةِ الْحَرْبِ مَنْ قَاتَلَ فَلْيُقَاتِلْ قِتَالَ عَاصِمْ أَوْ يُقَاتِلْ مِثْلَ عَاصِمْ The Prophet وسلم, said, this is how a battle is fought. Whoever wants to fight, fight like Asim. Imagine being that guy who hears the Prophet وسلم, say his name, and say, fight like this man, fight like Asim. So Asim who already has a certain type of uh, validation from the Messenger وسلم, and he was particularly skilled in archery. So he's kind of skilled in all of the arts of, of battle, uh, but he's particularly skilled in archery. And he says on the day of Badr, قَالَ وَاللَّهِ لَا يُغَادِ الرَّجُلُ مِنْكُمْ حَتَّى أَقْتُلَ بِكُلِّ سَهْمٍ رجلا. He said every single arrow that comes out is going to hit his target. Right? So he was ready on that day. And if you read about the history of the Muslims and how they were able to overcome larger armies, archery was really at the center of that. And Asim is central uh, to that particular strategy from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's the Battle of Badr. Now comes the Battle of Uhud. In the Battle of Uhud, we know about the tragedies of the companions that were martyred uh, from the side of the Muslims. If you see the grave of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and I only say this to refresh your memory, the man that's buried in a single grave with Hamza is Abdullah ibn Jahsh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The brother of Asim, meaning from the Muhajireen, the cousin of the Prophet وسلم, the eventual, you know, the, the, the one who uh, the Prophet وسلم, of course would marry Zainab bin Jahsh anha. So the Prophet وسلم, is related to him in multiple ways. He and Hamza are buried in one single grave. So Asim lost his brother in the Battle of Uhud. And there is a constant, you know, imagery that happens in this time of the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, of the ethics of the Muslims versus the vengeance and the, the nastiness of their opponents. So you remember, as we said, Abu Dujana reached Hind, bint Utba, with his sword and he said, I'm not gonna hit a woman with the sword of the Prophet Wasallam. Even if she's you know, instigating this battle and whatever role she's playing, I'm not going to do that. Hind bint Utba, on the other hand, uh, you know, mutilates the body of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abdullah ibn Jahsh was also one of those who was mutilated after his death and they made an example out of him. Muthila bihi means they made an example out of him to send a message to the Prophet ﷺ. So you have on one side the Prophet ﷺ who's insisting on the greatest ethics of battle even in the 
you know, in, in the lowest points and even as vulnerability is at its highest and you have on the other hand a people that are trying to make an example out of their opponents that are crucifying and that are uh, mutilating people even in death. So he loses his brother Abdullah ibn Jahsh radiallahu ta'ala anhu. His uncle Hanzala radiallahu ta'ala anhu dies in Uhud as well. He's one of the martyrs of Uhud as well. And he is the one that his body was raised to the heavens and washed and the companions found him in that state and he's called Ghasil al-Malaika, the one who was washed by the angels. Now as for him himself, Asim radiallahu ta'ala anhu started off with the archers and he stayed in that position and then he becomes one of those people who went and defended the Prophet Sallallahu one of the Ansar who defended the Prophet Sallallahu and did not flee from the battle, which was the majority of people, meaning the majority of people did actually flee from the battlefield in the second episode of Uhud. So he's one of those who stayed with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and continued to fight that battle. Now, why is his story so significant in Uhud in regards to you know, what he eventually gets marked for? Now on the other side of Uhud, there were women that came out that were banging the drums of war and were instigating the, the battle. And they had their wine and they basically wanted to uh, take revenge for those that were killed in Badr and you know, enjoy the corpses of the Muslims and to make an example out of them. And so there were three people, three women in particular. And when I say there's a plot twist in two weeks, it's the story of repenters. But three women who were leading that group of women that were instigating the battle, that were beating the, the drums of death basically, that were pushing for the battle to continue, and that were calling out for all sorts of vengeance. One of them, we already mentioned, was Hind bint Utbah. Hind bint Utbah, the wife of Abu Sufyan. The other one, the second one, was Rayta bint Munabbih. Rayta bint Munabbih, who's the wife of Amr bin As. So Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan, Rayta, the wife of Amr bin As, and the third one, whose story is very much so connected to the story of, uh, of, of Asim, is a woman by the name of Sulafa bint Sa'id. Sulafa bint Sa'id. Sulafa bint Sa'id is the wife of Talha ibn Abi Talha. Now if you go back and you read the history, Talha ibn Abi Talha was the boogeyman of Quraysh. He literally would come out in the beginning of the battle, call people out, and no one wanted to meet this guy. He would be killed in Uhud by Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Talha ibn Abi Talha. So she was out there with her husband, Talha ibn Abi Talha, and three of her sons who were in battle. Two of her sons were flag bearers. I know that you guys are going to probably ask, those of you that are taking notes, you can ask for, for notes, inshallah, you can ask for names at the end of this, inshallah. I don't want to overwhelm you, but I at least want to give you the scene. Her husband's the main guy dueling, two of her sons are flag bearers on the other side. Their names are Al Musafir and Al Harith. Al Musafir and Al Harith. And they're going forward. Now, the difference, obviously, between her and the other two women is that the other two women are there to avenge a previous death. She's not necessarily there to avenge a previous death. She did not lose anyone, particularly that was uh, noteworthy to her in the Battle of Badr. But she is there encouraging her husband, encouraging her sons to fight the Muslims on the day of Uhud. Now what ends up happening, Ali radiallahu anhu beats Talha ibn Abi Talha in the duel in the very beginning of Uhud. Her two sons, Musafir and Al-Hanith, the flag bearers, were both killed by Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu. All right? So she loses her all three of her sons, in fact, her third son also dies, but not at the hands of Asim. Asim was responsible for the death of two of her, of her sons that were fighting on the side of Quraysh. So when the battle of Uhud finishes, and you have Hind cutting out the, the liver of Hamza radiallahu anhu, and you have you know, people that are making an example out of the Muslims' bodies, she comes to find out that her husband and her three sons all passed away against the Muslims. And she comes to find out that Asim ibn Thabit, radiallahu ta'ala anhu in particular, 
was responsible for the death of two of her sons. Some narrations say all three of them, in fact, at the hands of Asim. So what does she do? She takes an oath, not by Allah. She swears by Allah al Uzza. She swears by the idols. She says that I will not rest until the head of Asim is brought to me and I drink wine out of his skull. That's the vengeance. That's the that, that spirit of vengeance. I want his head. Someone bring me his head. I want to drink wine out of the man's head. Now here's the thing. I'm going to give you an early plot twist. Uh, there's a particular family that takes care of the Kaaba until now. The Prophet ﷺ handed the keys to Uthman ibn Abi Talha. That's his mom. <laughs> All right, Uthman ibn Abi Talha radiallahu anhu. Until now, that family maintains the keys of the Kaaba. It was a wealthy family, a powerful family. They embrace Islam eventually. But at this point, this is a woman that is wealthy, that is angry, and that wants vengeance. So she puts a price tag on the head of Asim radiallahu ta'ala anhu that was only put on the head of one man before Asim. And here's like a bonus points question for you. Who do you think that man was? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was fleeing from Mecca. There was a bounty that was put on the head of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of a hundred camels. And that's why Suraq ibn Malik went after him. And what that type of a bounty does is it basically brings people out against you that don't even have an interest in battle. But that was a bounty that was only put on the Prophet ﷺ before Asim radiallahu ta'ala anhu. All he did was, of course, is he fought in the battle the way that you're supposed to fight in battle. But subhanAllah, these are the plot twists that exist at this time. This is a rich woman. She now has the wealth of her family and she wants to offer all the wealth that she possibly can for the head of Asim ibn Thabit to particularly drink wine out of his head so that she could make a point of her anger and her vengeance towards Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu. After the battle of Uhud, and this is where I want you to appreciate at least for the next few weeks, because we're going to be in this scene for the next three weeks inshallah ta'ala to some extent. There was a sense of invincibility that the Muslims had after Badr. And there was a fear that all of the surrounding tribes had of the Muslims that maybe they had some sort of you know, divine aid. And they did have divine aid to where they could not be attacked. And so that was all gone after Uhud. After Uhud, every single element of the prophetic community, of the Prophet and his community, felt a sense of vulnerability, outside and inside. So let me actually lay these out for you, inshallah ta'ala, so you can actually appreciate this. For one, Quraysh feels emboldened. They're already plotting their next attack. We struck them. We killed a significant amount of them. We have shaken Medina. So they're already thinking about how they can come back and attack Medina once again. All of these tribes that exist, these bandits and Bedouins that exist in the desert, they now know of the bounties and they sense the vulnerability of Medina. So we can loot Medina. We can attack the Muslims when they're weak, when they're grieving their dead. We can steal their belongings. We can, we can get in on this business basically of attacking them. So you have them on the inside. The hypocrites start to show themselves with a great sense of emboldenment after Uhud, right? So they go to the Muslims and they say to them, where were those angels that came to you in Badr? What happened now? The Prophet only has promised you ghurur, delusion. You're in trouble. We told you, don't take these people in. So they're hearing it from the hypocrites. Those that they have treaties with, the Prophet ﷺ has treaties with people on the inside, some of the Jewish tribes on the inside, some of the polytheistic tribes on the outside, they are now rethinking their treaties, right? What's the point of being in a treaty with a weak community, with a community that's now vulnerable? So the Prophet ﷺ has to negotiate all of these realities in an instant while grieving some of the most beloved people in the world to him. And it's in this moment that the Prophet ﷺ has to act quickly. And so one of the things that happens right after Uhud is that the Prophet ﷺ has to dispatch an army to Hamra al-Asad. It's about eight miles away from Uhud to basically scare Abu Sufyan and scare Quraysh away from 
gathering themselves once again and, and plotting another attack on Medina. So he has to preemptively try to strike some fear in them and get them out of Medina, push them as far away from Medina as possible. The Prophet ﷺ, um, he learns of a plot from one of the bandit tribes, which is going to be very important in the story, the tribe of Hudayl. He learns of a plot for them, from them to attack Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ appoints uh, a small battalion to go out and to preemptively attack them uh, under Abdullah ibn Unais. Um, ta'ala anhu. And subhanAllah, look at what the Prophet ﷺ says. The Prophet ﷺ tells Abdullah ibn Unais to go and to attack the chief of Hudayl because he's plotting an attack. And the chief of Hudayl was a man by the name of Khalid ibn Sufyan. Abdullah ibn Unais says to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, I've never seen him before. And the Prophet ﷺ says, neither have I, but he looks like a shaytan, he looks like a devil. When you see him, you will know him. And subhanAllah, Abdullah ibn Unais, he goes to the location and he immediately sees Khalid ibn Sufyan, he said, the man looked like a shaytan, the, the, the most evil looking person I'd ever seen. And he's able to uh, take out Khalid ibn Sufyan and basically cut off that attack from the tribe of Hudayl. Now what's going to happen at this point? The Prophet ﷺ is subjected to an evil plot that takes the ethics of the people of Mecca to a new low. Which was that they basically decided to, to send these people to the Prophet ﷺ to ask for Sahaba to come and teach them the Qur'an in different places. and. Under that pretext of da'wah, the Prophet ﷺ will send his companions to teach these people, to give them da'wah. They'll then attack those companions and massacre them. Now one of the things about the Arabs is that they prided themselves in being noble, in honoring treaties, and in, in not attacking a person under protection. All of these different things, even when they were not Muslims. But now, Uhud kind of changes the atmosphere, it changes the mood for them as well. So they came to the Prophet ﷺ, and Hudayl in particular sent a group to the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, these two Bedouin tribes, they were known as Al-Udal and Al-Qara. And they said, pretend to be Muslims and ask the Prophet ﷺ to send teachers from the Sahaba and ask him for the best of the companions. SubhanAllah. So these two tricks of Bi'r Ma'una and al Raji' are going to come from people who come to the Prophet ﷺ and say, we're Muslims and we want you to send Sahaba with us, to send some companions with us to teach our people the Qur'an and they'll be under our protection the entire time. So the massacres that are going to happen are going to happen under that stated protection. And this is what makes this particularly difficult and hard on the Prophet ﷺ. You know, SubhanAllah, when people are killed in battle, at least they're face to face. When companions are ambushed and massacred in that number, it's a different level of, it is adding insult to injury, and in this case, even injury to injury, because there will be more people that are going to be killed in these two instances than Uhud itself, as we said. So the Prophet ﷺ will end up sending 70 uh, to Bi'r Ma'una, or, or to a Najd, under the pretext of da'wah once again. And Najd is about five times bigger than the Hijaz. So it's a huge da'wah opportunity. So when they come to the Prophet and they say, Ya Rasulullah, give us these people, send them with us, and let them teach us the Qur'an. The Prophet knows that if Najd becomes Muslim, that's bigger than Mecca and Medina and everyone put together. So he sends 70 Sahaba, 70 of the best, Qurra, uh, people of the Qur'an, people who are, you know, for, the, for the most part, from Ahl al-Suffa, that were known for their qiyamul layl, that were known for their righteousness. He sends them there. And in the case of the smaller, uh, the smaller campaign here, it is al-raji'r, al-raji'r, uh, which we're going to talk about as it relates to Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So the Prophet sallallahu he sends six or 10 with these two tribes. Now the way that these Bedouins would operate is that they would ambush the Sahaba further away from Medina and closer to Mecca because obviously they're further away from their home base. And so you're going to find Bi'r Ma'una literally is the well of Ma'una and they used to name their, their battles and their campaigns after the wells, right? So the Battle of Badr is around uh, Badr. Hudaybiyah obviously is around the wells. 
Ma'una is a well, al raji is a well. It's right on the outskirts of Mecca. And Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu is in this particular group. And we're going to talk about two men in particular, inshallah ta'ala, over the next uh, few weeks. So you could put their, their names on the screen, inshallah ta'ala. They're six or they are ten of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now the reason why I have them separated by three and by three is because these six people are going to be caught and they're going to be ambushed in this particular um, in this particular incident of al-Rajir. The top three, Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu was in charge of them, Marthad ibn Abi Marthad and Khalid ibn Wukair, are not going to surrender, surrender themselves when they get ambushed. The second three, Khubayb radiallahu anhu, we'll talk about next week in detail, Zayd ibn Dathina and Abdullah ibn Tariq radiallahu anhu, they surrender themselves during the ambush because they've been given another level of protection, which turns out to be again khiyana, which turns out to be a betrayal on the side of these tribes. So these six men, some of the narrations say 10, but we have the names of these six. Basically, they are traveling and they're going under the pretext of teaching people Islam. And as they get close to Mecca, they start to hear an army that comes towards them. And this army was from Banu Al-Hiyan under Hudayl. They track them down with their date seeds. So they recognize their date seeds, and that was the plan. Their date seeds were the date seeds of Medina. So they basically followed their tracks and they tracked them down by their date seeds. And then over a hundred men ambushed these six men, or these ten men, uh, on the outskirts of Mecca. Now, what these six men do, radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een, is they take to a hill. So they flee and they get to a hill and they basically protect themselves behind something. Hudayl calls out and they say to them, listen, They said, look, uh, go ahead and turn yourselves in. We don't intend to kill you six. We don't intend to kill you all. What we want to do is take you as prisoners and go to Mecca and get something out of you. So we'll either exchange you for other prisoners or we'll sell you into captivity. But you can either fight us and die and you're, you're outnumbered or you come to us and we'll find a way to negotiate a prisoner exchange in Mecca and things of that sort. So SubhanAllah, I mean, they have to think really quickly and all six of them basically think about this differently. So the group in that situation, three of them decide that they'll come out in captiv captivity. Three of them say, we'll continue the fight. Now, what was the logic of going out into captivity and accepting the terms of captivity? Number one, they were not fighters. They were ambassadors. That's number one. Number two, what they thought to themselves was that there could be some sort of negotiation between the Prophet ﷺ and Mecca, between Medina and Mecca, and perhaps they'll get exchanged somehow with the Prophet ﷺ, or the Prophet ﷺ will find a way uh, to free them. And so they still have a chance at making their way back to Medina. On the other hand, you have the three that decided to stay back and fight, uh, Asim ibn Thabit, Marthad, and Khalid ibn Bukair. And their logic was that these people can't be trusted. They've already betrayed us once. What makes us think they're not going to betray us again? Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu in particular knows exactly what's on his head. The bounty that exists on his head. And Asim is the prize of these six people. Right? Asim is the prize of these six people. Now all six of them have something to worry about, but he's the one. Right? He has a bounty of a hundred camels on his head. So Asim radiallahu anhu says, I'm going to keep fighting. So three of them surrender, three of them continue to fight, and obviously when you're in battle, this happens rapidly. It's not like they had a chance to sit down and talk things through, right? In fact, it's very likely that all six of them don't even have a chance to coordinate at all, right? So some of them are coming out one by one to surrender themselves to this army. Some of them are staying back but at the end of the day, it ends up being three that come down and three that end up in this particular uh, fight. Asim radiallahu ta'ala anhu 
He says, Amma ana fala anzilu fi dhimmati mushrik. He said, As for me, I'm not going to put myself in the protection of these polytheists. And so they then start to attack the three of them. Marthad radiallahu anhu is martyred. Khalid radiallahu ta'ala anhu is martyred. And Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the one who basically stands his ground for the longest period. I mean, he fights with everything, fights back with his arrows fought back with any object that he could particular find and they even got exhausted with him radiallahu anhu even though he was one man and eventually they got so exhausted with him that they decided it's no point I mean he actually was able to according to some of the narrations uh, kill some of those that went to kill him it's no point to fight him up close let's just stay back and just rain down arrows and rain down whatever objects we possibly can on this man radiallahu ta'ala anhu and it's here subhanallah that Asim radiallahu ta'ala anhu is some of the most profound poetry that's narrated from him as he is, as he is uh, fighting alone. And he says, Wallahu a'lamu wa lillahi alhamdu wal minna ma illati wa ana jildun nabilu wal qawsu fiha watarun unabilu tazillu an safhatiha al ma'abilu al mawtu haqqun wal hayatu batilu innam uqatilkum fa ummi habilu. And he continues to say, uh, you know, he continues to say, وَمُؤْمِنٌ بِمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى مُحَمَّدِ That I am a believer in what has been revealed to Muhammad. So he, he's, he's basically chanting out that he is going to continue this battle and that he will never submit himself or surrender himself uh, to these people and that he is a believer and that it is the life of the hereafter that is truth and is the life of this world that is falsehood. Now, subhanAllah, he makes a dua in this moment that is deeply profound. And this is where the story of Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu becomes the legendary story that it is in the books of history. He says, Allahumma inni hamaytu deenaka awwal al-nahar fahmi li lahmi akhirahu Allahumma inni hamaytu deenaka awwal al-nahar fahmi li lahmi akhirahu Which basically means, and it's, it's said that he used to make this dua as soon as he heard about the bounty that was on his head. He used to say, Oh Allah, I protected your religion in the beginning of its affair. Meaning, I used to fight on your behalf in the beginning of Islam, when no one else would stand up and defend the Prophet ﷺ except for a handful of people. So, Oh Allah, protect me. And he says, particularly protect my body in the end of my affair. So I used to protect your religion. This is literally a definition of a first, of one of the sabiqun al-awwalun. I gave everything to protect your religion in the beginning of its affair. So protect my body in the end of my affair. And so as he continues to fight, they rain down all of these objects on him, arrows, until Asim radiallahu ta'ala anhu was martyred. And subhanAllah, he did not ask Allah to protect his soul. He asked Allah to protect his body. It's a very specific dua that he asked from Allah Azza to protect his body. Now when they rain down these arrows and they rain down these objects, as soon as they realized that he was dead, it was as if they forgot about the other ones that they killed and they all started to celebrate that they killed Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So they start to chant out and they start to shout out. And you can imagine the scene of jubilation on their end, thinking about the reward that they're going to get when they take the body of Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu to Sulafa bint Sa'ad and they get their 100 camels. But here's what happens. And this is the plot twist, subhanAllah, that ends up happening a few times. There are more miracles, as the ulama say, in Raji' in Ma'una than at any other point in the seerah. When they went to go and get the body of Asim radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they found a curtain of bees, nahl, that surrounded his body. And they said to themselves, all right, well, let's try to move them out of the way. So they basically took their, their weapons and they started to try to move through the bees and some of them got stung by these bees. And then they tried to go from the back of the hill. And they found that Asim radiallahu anhu was surrounded by bees on the back of the hill as well. His body was surrounded by bees from the back of the hill as well. So they tried for hours to get his body until it basically got dark and they said, you know what? Let's wait. I mean, maybe these insects come out, these bees come out only during the daytime or at some point. Let's wait until the morning 
and let's see if we can go get his body then. And subhanAllah, at that moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a rain upon them that literally starts to flood the valleys. And the body of Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu is taken in that storm, in that rain, and it goes down one of the rivers and they never found his body radiallahu ta'ala anhu. SubhanAllah. And that's why he gains the nickname Dafinullah or Dafinul Malaika. The one who was buried by Allah or the one who was buried by the angels radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, I mean Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the brother-in-law. Jamila radiallahu anha is his wife, the sister of Asim. When Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu heard about the story, he used to say, Subhanallah, Yahfadullahu al-Abdul Mu'min. Allah protects his believing slave. He said, Kana Asim, Nadra and La Yamasahu Mushrikun, Wala Yamasa Mushrikan Abada fi Hayatihi. So that Asim radiallahu anhu used to swear that I will never be touched by a polytheist and I will never touch a polytheist at this point. So he said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected his body in death the way that Allah protected him in life. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then Umar radiallahu anhu, as we said, went on to name his son Asim ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So subhanAllah, it's in this particular incident that the first martyr comes back to the Prophet ﷺ, the first set of martyrs comes back to the Prophet ﷺ of the people that were killed in al rajir And this is the first miracle that we find with the body of Asim ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And inshallah ta'ala next week we'll continue and we'll talk about Khubayb ibn Adi radiallahu anhu and, and, and the, the rest of them with whom many of these martyr, uh, miracles actually took place. And the irony as we're going to see subhanAllah is that the incident of Asim led to some of those people becoming Muslim <laughs> because they saw what happened, right? The incident of the martyrdom of Asim radiallahu ta'ala anhu led to uh, some of those people becoming Muslim. And of course, in this particular family, if you think back to that, uh, to, the, to the chart, the uncle of Asim is Hanzala, Ghasil al-Malaika, Hanzala who was washed by the angels, and Asim radiallahu anhu is Dafin al-Malaika, the one who was buried by the angels radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een and inshallah ta'ala we will continue next week with this devastating incident in the life of the Prophet sallallahu through the eyes of another great companion Khubayb ibn Adi uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, and inshallah ta'ala with that we will stop we'll take a couple of questions and we will uh, move on bidna Allah yeah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So how did the Prophet ﷺ come to find out about them? We're actually going to find, and we'll talk about this next week, that the Prophet ﷺ receives revelation about their death before the news comes back to him, alayhi salatu wasalam. Now subhanAllah, the question becomes, well, you know, why were they not protected? And this is the thing here, that you look at what happens with these people, how Allah Azza wa honors them with shahada, but at the same time puts miracles in the wake of their martyrdom, right? Obviously in Medina though, the pain that comes back to Ash-Shamus, to Jamila, to the, the families of these people is no less. And it still shakes the community quite a bit. But it was really here that the community you know, is suffering now at this point, the loss of over 140 people between Uhud and this in just a short period of time. And by the way, SubhanAllah, this actually happens uh, in the month of Safar. I forgot to mention that, I wanted to mention in the very beginning. I don't think I did in the month of Safar, four years after Hijrah which we are in right now. So exactly 1,441 Hijri years ago, this is when this uh, incident takes place of al Radir and uh, Ma'una, radiallahu anhu ajma'in. Any other questions? Yeah. How did we get what he said? Because of the people that became Muslim after they killed him. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, I told you, it's, it gets very interesting. In two weeks, we'll talk about the repentant murderers. Next week, we'll talk about the rest, Khubayb radiallahu anhu and those who were martyred. But that's how we end up getting these incidents. 
Any sisters have any questions? Yeah. What's that? So the three companions that were mentioned, uh, Khalid, Marthad, Khalid ibn Bukair, Martha ibn Abi Marthad, and Asim were, were killed there. And again, some of the scholars say there were more people that were also killed with them. And then the other three are brought down and they're taken into captivity. Abdullah ibn Tariq uh, dies almost instantly after that. There's an incident with him. And then it, became, it becomes Khubayb and Zayd uh, that are taken as prisoners for a long time until uh, their story plays out in a very different way also, which we'll talk about next week, inshallah. Time. Anyone else? Sisters? Brothers? You have a question? No? Sorry. Uh, yeah, last question, Sean. Assalamu alaikum. Do you The names of? So Sulafa bin Sa'id is the wife of Talha ibn Abi Talha. And um, it's her son, Uthman ibn Abi Talha, who becomes the keeper of the Kaaba, uh, the keys of the Kaaba, and the Prophet ﷺ bestows that upon their family afterwards. Uh, you're talking about the, 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 the children of Sulafa? Al Musafir and Al Harith. Al Musafir and Al Harith. Yeah. No, Talha ibn Abi Talha? He's the father. He wasn't, he's not mentioned in the battle. So either he was too young or he wasn't present. Yeah. With Amr ibn Tufayl? That's next week, inshallah. Yeah, so we'll continue with al Raji' next week, inshallah. And in in uh, Amr ibn Tufayl is involved with Ma'una, Bir Ma'una. So Bir Ma'una and Raji' happen at the same time, they happen simultaneous to one another. Okay, inshallah, we'll go ahead and we will stop there, bidnillah, and uh, we'll continue next week.